they though are still INTPs. And so even though they are more social, that doesn't mean that they always get all the social cues. And so they have decided to stir the pot a little bit. They mess with things, kind of poke the bear a little bit, um, and then just playfully dance away. <laughs> I welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. This week on the show, we're talking about INTP careers. You might be an INTP listening right now or have an INTP in your life. Some of us do. And uh, this conversation is going to be all about the career path, the job path for the INTP personality type. We've decided to talk about this in a very particular way this week. And this entire conversation, we'll talk about how we're going to do this in a moment. This entire conversation came about Antonia because you and I right now are guiding a group of students through what's called our personality life path mentorship program. This is a live mentorship where we take the eight Jungian cognitive functions, the building blocks of the Myers-Briggs system, the four decision-making functions and the four learning functions. And we spend one week on each of these functions in this program where we give students exercises to tune in to the archetypical energy that that function represents in the world and in their life particularly and in their personality type. We give them exercises, they go out in the world and they test in the real world these energies, report back, and each week over eight weeks leading toward a live event, we build a plan that they can implement. We build it together, but each person has a plan they can implement that we call their life path. Now that they know who they are, where are they going with their personality? We've noticed that people in this program are in the middle of transition. They're in the middle of a relationship transition, a life transition, but a lot of people are in the middle of career transition. And so we thought, let's just take a moment and do a short series, 16-part series, on careers. We'll look at each personality type because so many people we believe are right now in the middle of transition based on world events and just the circumstances we all find ourselves in. So this is your turn this week, INTPs, to talk about your career path and some of the options available to you. Antonia, you want to talk a little bit about just broad brush, the framework we're going to do this with this week. Yeah, this entire series we've done has been sitting on the platform of Dr. Dario Nardi's research on subtypes. And the reason for that is as he was understanding the different brain wiring of the people within the same personality type, but wired just a little differently to create these four subtypes, he realized that career choice was a massive influence in the subtype that the individual you know, was most aligned with. And then he also realized that if a person changed careers, it started altering their wiring. It started making them look like a different subtype. So your career path and your subtype are very, very uh, sort of married to each other. So a part of why we want to address subtypes in these career podcasts and today in INTP careers is uh, your subtype isn't like your your INTP preferences. That seems to be sort of pre-wired, maybe more, you know, nature oriented. You come out of the hatch with your, your Myers-Briggs preferences, but your subtype seems to be more nurture. It is, a, it, it's optional ways of exploring your personality type based on your responses to the environment. And it makes sense that this would be aligned with careers because that's what you're spending 40 hours plus a week doing. That's the environment that you're in all the time. So those are the problems that you're solving and the things you have to respond and react to. Yeah. So a part of going through this isn't just talking about careers that INTPs would like or excel at. It's also, how do you want to manifest your type? How do you want it to look? What are the aspects of your personality that you would like to explore? And making choices around careers might be a way to you know, sort of expand your relationship to your best fit type. Maybe get some of that money that's being left on the table, you know, figuratively and uh, literally, that can help you access a, a, a more breadth in your relationship to your type. Okay, so before we get into that, though, Antonia, I went and did my internet research. I have a top 10 list, according to the internets, of INTP careers. You want to hear them? This is the... Yeah, these are usually pretty good lists. Some of these can be stereotypical, mm. but some, you know, you're an ITP listening. You're like, I do that for a living. <laughs> That's what I do. Number one. So these are the INTP careers, according to the internet, top 10. 
Number one, software developer. Number two, data scientist. Three, computer systems and analyst. Four, architect. Five, mathematician. There you go. Six, physicist. Seven, economist. Eight, technical writer. Nine, engineer. And 10, university professor mm -hmm. as the number 10 for INTP careers. Yeah, yeah. That's a pretty decent list. You need a lot of education for almost everything on that. Yeah, <laughs> so which... assuming that you've gotten a lot of education under your belt, and as we go through the different subtypes, what's interesting is that those, you know, some of those careers do show up yeah. as ideals for certain subtypes. But they're, you know, there's not every not every career that I drummed up is necessarily on that list. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Dario Nardi has been doing brain scan research with subjects around personality types. So he knows personality types of individuals. They come into his laboratory. He connects to EEG machines, does a series of exercises and questions, and watches what shows up on the brain scans. He's noticed from the brain scans, there's four basic patterns that keep showing up across all types, not just INTPs. And he's clustered these into four groupings, like quadrant, if you will. And he also noticed that the there was some crossover with Dr. Helen Fisher's work around neurotransmitters. We're not going to go into all the technical science, the deep INTP level technical <laughs> science today. We're just going to get broad brush information. You can go do some more research on your own. We'll talk about it in both an accessible way, maybe for people new to type, but we'll also go a little deeper into some of this uh, research, just talking a little bit about the neurotransmitters and how we arrive at this cluster of four based on the brain scans. What does this look like from a personality type lens with cognitive functions, let's say. So the, the names of these four subtypes is the dominant INTP, creative INTP, normalizing INTP, and harmonizing INTP. Now those names apply to all the other types as well, but we're talking about INTPs today. So dominant, creative, normalizing, harmonizing. These are not types of INTPs. These are expressions of the INTP personality. So if the INTP personality, metaphorically or in, you know, in an analog or an analogy way, is a sheet of music, written notes of music, these are the four performances of the personality type. These are the way it can be expressed. Anything else you want to say about that before we jump right into the actual ones? Yeah. Think of the subtypes as almost flavors. Like yeah. you said, it's there's different ways that they can be expressed. And the reason why we want to make a distinction between the subtypes and type is as I mentioned before, they are they're they're flexible. There's a plasticness to this, and you might you know as a listener, you might identify yourself in more than one subtype, and that's very common because depending upon our life, life circumstances, we've had opportunities to develop some of these traits, yeah. and so you might have started out as one, and now you find yourself in a career path or just circumstances that bring up a different subtype, or you might identify with all four. That's not uncommon either. The other thing I want to mention is that you might recognize these subtype names as also being used by Dr. Victor Galenko, who is a person who works in socionics. Mm. And uh, Dario, with permission, is using these names because uh, they're they're kind of perfect, actually. Those yeah. four subtype names are are really get to the center of how these subtypes show up. Absolutely. And just to that point, Dario did want to call these variants. Mm-hmm because you didn't want people to think they're actual types. <laughs> yeah. But the word variant was hijacked by world <laughs> circumstances. So variant has a whole different meaning now. At least for the moment, right? At least for <laughs> this time period in history, variant is something that is, has a very specific picture in a lot of people's names. So yeah. flavors, subtypes, it's yeah, kind of, it gives that. you it gives you the idea. So let's jump into the dominant INTP subtype. What does the dominant INTP subtype look like? So these, uh, the word dominant is fantastic because these INTPs show up in a very assertive way. Uh, they're comfortable with managerial and out front leadership positions. So these INTPs do not shy away from leadership. Uh, they are like other INTPs, but on a larger scale. Think of them as more intense and just taking in more territory. And they often act as uh, consummate strategists and and top consultants all right so yeah. they don't shy away from leadership positions but they usually don't want to be the person at the very top they usually want to be a consultant to the person at the very top because then they're free of constant decision making and then they also don't have to take all the blame for any mistakes 
they like to be in a, a top advisory role, but they definitely don't shy away from those positions. They are uh, very commonly entrepreneurs. So it's very common for dominant INTPs to go into an entrepreneurial or go that direction. But then they oftentimes find themselves in organizations and communities that, that allow them to match their values and their principles um, with what they're doing, but then somebody else handles execution and details. So there's an attraction to entrepreneurship, but there's also a lot of stuff that comes along with entrepreneurship, having to do a lot of detail management and that sort of thing. Yeah. And so they, these dominant INTPs, they're still INTPs, right? And so they usually let other people handle some of those, those more mundane tasks. There is surprisingly very little starburst pattern. So if you've listened to us talk about these subtypes in some of the other type and career um, podcasts, there's a starburst pattern that is associated with brainstorming. And, uh, and that's what shows up in those EEG machine readings. And the, the dominant INTP has a very weak one, mm. which means that they're not actually using their, their second function of extroverted intuition or exploration. They're not using it as much in, in unstructured creativity. Usually when they're brainstorming, it's very specifically to solve a problem. And they, uh, they tend to instead be very, t- you know, dialed in or tuned into speaking and listening, language-based reasoning, and uh, figuring out how to flex and flow in a context while staying true to a principle. So that's more of what they're trying to figure out. So as opposed to just like brainstorming any idea, it's very much specifically used to, to figure out how to navigate spaces while staying to their to whatever core principle they're attached to. They're, uh, and, and this might be a bit of the stereotype of an INTP when they're young. This is very common for younger INTPs. Now, if, they, if a person stays a dominant INTP and grows into seasoning and maturity, they can take on spectacular leadership characteristics. But when they're young, this is that argumentative INTP. That, that's, there's that stereotype about the INTP that's always ready to like tell you how it is. Say what? Yeah. <laughs> and then these are the unseasoned versions of this subtype. Uh, Dari calls them objective hard hitters, speaking their mind as needed, particularly when something is counter to their understanding. If they're immature, this makes them argumentative, critical, highly skeptical, right? They're not open to new information. And again, their extroverted intuition or exploration co-pilot or auxiliary function, we'll talk about what that means in a moment if you're new to type. But that part of them, that intuitive part, is not as open to brainstorming, which one, might be one of the reasons why they have a hard time inputting information until they figure out that piece. So if something doesn't follow a core concept, it goes unheard or it doesn't even exist. Right? Uh, but if they are right, then they are the representatives of truth of the universe. They'll say it as many times as it needs to be said, even if people are perpetually ignoring them. So that's really the thing that they do excellent is that they are, they are stewards of objective truths even when no other people don't want to hear them. Unfortunately, if they're wrong, it's almost it's a near hopeless task to try to get them to shift perspectives. <laughs> so when a dominant INTP is younger, immature, and less seasoned, it, it's going to be very difficult to get them to see something outside of what they've already figured out on their own. But if they are seasoned, if they're mature, now you've got somebody who is willing to be a bastion of truth, uh, even when it's difficult. Yeah. They're comfortable with principles and lovers of power. Uh, they usually are patient. Actually, interestingly enough, they move patiently, always looking for places where leverage can be employed. So it's a it's really about leadership um, through calibration, hmm. figuring out how to continue down a path by leveraging all of the opportunities that come along. And uh, they're strategists. You know, usually TP types tend to be more tacticians, but these dominant INTPs have a bit more of a strategic mind. So they can see a little further down the line and they move people, products, ideas towards a core um, idea or agenda. And so that makes them the, more, the most assertive of any of the INTP types. I think this idea of, you call it levers of power, mm-hmm. it's an interesting concept. I think that most of the dominant subtypes across all 16 Myers-Briggs types are okay with hierarchy. And not just okay with it, they're okay being at the top of that hierarchy if they need to be in a leadership way. But I think INTPs are unique in that they don't mind being at the top if they need to be, especially dominant you know, INTPs, 
uh, but they're okay with that advisory. They they understand that like if I want to get something done, I ha- that I still don't like this hierarchy very much, but I'm willing to play the game because I know that's how stuff happens. I know that's a lever point. Yeah. Uh, but there's still, still that little subversive element I think to INTPs, even the ones that are dominant that are okay with hierarchy. There's a little bit of the damn the man. I'm I'm not going to totally play nice with the system. I'm going to always have a little bit of that rebellious nature in the back of my mind. I don't know if you can get that out of NPs in general. Of course. Actually, you bit perceivers. Just perceivers in general just have that little bit of them. I think so. You can't completely get out of them. That said, I think the one thing that sets dominant INTPs apart from other dominant subtypes as well is that they want to be at the top of the food chain, but they're okay with somebody else being at the very top. Yeah. Right. They're, They're all right with not occupying that position and uh in part because they don't want to have to do all the stuff yeah (laughs) right they're like they're like i'd like to be in an advisory role i'll tell you how to make it happen and at the same time i mean obviously uh any person who puts themselves in a position of going up the food chain or in an entrepreneurial position it it, it's not a it's not laziness right it's like obviously anybody in this situation is going to be a very hard worker It's just it's not always interesting to pay attention to all the little details and the mundane tasks that need to be done. And and it especially is very uncomfortable to be blamed when maybe you were the person who strategized something, but it didn't roll out exactly how you imagined. And so I think even dominant INTPs are not really want they don't really want to put themselves in that position. And so sort of being the advisor to the king is that's the sweet spot. So let's talk about some of the careers that a dominant might find themselves in. Okay, well, based on my description, it's going to be unsurprising what this list came out with. Um, so we've got management consultant, which is the thing I just mentioned, a strategic planner, policy analyst, business analyst, data scientist, research scientist, economist, intellectual, intellectual property consultant, information security analyst, urban planner, political strategist, venture capitalist, marketing strategist, operations research analyst, and nonprofit organization director. A lot of analysts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, lots of uh, analysts and planners and strategists and consultants and management. So yeah. uh, what's interesting about this list is, of course, this is not comprehensive, right? It's like you can be a dominant INTP and be in other careers, but it's this style, if you can s- sort of spot the pattern, it's yeah. the style of career that's going to help an INTP move into more of that dominant INTP framework. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about a layer deeper now for any type geek or somebody that likes the cognitive function level. So as an INTP, the driver or dominant cognitive function, this is the way the INTP makes decisions. Technically, this cognitive function is called introverted thinking. We've nicknamed it accuracy. It's all about finding the accurate, most precise truth, the uh, building blocks, principle-based truth to build from and always looking for the logical consistency, uh, depersonalizing things to find the logic and the reasoning behind decisions. That's paired with a co-pilot or auxiliary cognitive function, so learning or perceiving function, technically called extroverted intuition. We nickname it exploration, and this is all about outward pattern recognition, messing with the environment, connecting disparate things, asking what-if questions, and seeing what happens. And this is how an INTP perceives their world and moves through the world. Now, there's an attunement with these two front functions, the driver, dominant, or co-pilot auxiliary. The way these functions are attuned inform which subtype the person is. So a dominant INTP subtype, and this is a good time to introduce the concept of analytic versus uh, holistic. How does the function look, the functions look for an INTP at this level? Right. You just use the words analytic and holistic, and those are words to describe our relationship to these specific functions. Yeah. So each function can go one of two directions. It can go either more focused, uh, assertive, really in, with a lot of intentionality to head towards almost like a single, you know, a fixed point, almost mm. you could call it. Uh, That could even be a principle, doesn't necessarily have to be a goal, but it's uh, almost think of it as as so focused that you have blinders on. Mm. That's the more analytic version of a function. And then there's a holistic version, which is a bit more open framed. You have a more dispersed energy style when you're using it in this way. And so you don't have as much focus on a single point, but you have a little bit more periphery to look at. 
It's not as assertive. It's a more diffused energetic space. And we can use each of these functions in either way, really. Yeah, I just want to make a comment. This is not about capacity or proficiency. So analytic doesn't mean, oh, I'm more proficient than I would be if I was holistic. It's not about proficiency. Mm -hmm. It's about intentionality and focus. Yeah, how you use your energy. Do you use your energy a little bit more like a sniper or do you use it a little bit more scattershot, yeah. right? Or you could think of it in terms of meditation. Are you meditating on a single point in the wall or are you doing something more like Shambhala where you're lidding your eyes and seeing a bigger picture? So each of the functions can be used either way, but yeah. we end up having a preference for one side or the other. And really the the ideal is that we would use both, you know, you'd use each of the functions that are our stewardship. I always think of it as our stewardship, but the functions that are the our pre-wiring leads us towards using both, you know, or having both capacities is really the ideal. Yeah. But when we tend to land on one side or the other, that gives us a certain flavor to our type. And for dominant INTPs, both of those functions, both introverted thinking accuracy and extroverted intuition or exploration, both of them have an analytic bent. And that would make sense, right? A dominant subtype would be one that's more focused, has a more direct energy, doesn't really take into the side, you know, the peripheral as much as they are just the thing that makes sense to them and they're moving forward with that. Yeah. So that's the dominant style. And um, for those of you who want to go further down this rabbit hole, we did an entire video podcast and audio podcast with Dr. Dario Nardi not that many episodes ago, probably within the last 20 episodes, um, maybe 25, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but we we talked about what it means to have different subtypes, what it means to have an analytic versus holistic bent, uh, what some of these neurotransmitters look like. And that whole conversation is very enlightening. Yeah. And from a neurotransmitter standpoint, the chemical or neurotransmitter associated with a dominant is testosterone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the preferred chemical or neurotransmitter. Uh, okay, so both of these functions are analytic, and we talked about the type, we, or the subtype, we talked about the neurotransmitter, the jobs. Let's move over now to creatives. What does the creative subtype look like for INTPs? All right, I, uh, I think a lot of INTPs are going to identify with this one. Oh, by the way, uh, for the dominant INTPs, I have a feeling that they mistype as judgers, oh, and sometimes right. even extroverts. So that's the one thing you should keep in mind, is that dominant INTPs sometimes have trouble finding their best fit type. Like maybe ENTP could be one that mm -hmm. they mistype as, maybe even ETJ, if mm -hmm. they're taking charge and leading yeah. things, and they're they're judging primary, so. Yeah, yeah, and they might even think they're like, possibly, I mean, as weird as it sounds, maybe an ESTJ because they're not yeah. doing as much of the traditional brainstorming. Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. So creative INTPs are, uh, well, the description will not surprise you. They're the creative type. So they're curious, playful, funny, right? They're, uh, uh, this is the INTP that's a little bit more sociable. They might even look like an extrovert because they have that playful spirit about them. They're higher up in energy and enthusiasm than the other subtypes. And so there's like a kind of buoyancy about this, this subtype. They tend to pose a lot of questions and offer ideas. They have a very strong, solid star, starburst pattern. So they are the brainstormers of the INTPs. Uh, these are the ones who love just sort of unstructured creativity. They love playing with ideas and thoughts. They're very open. Um, they might be some of the most open-minded of the INTP subtypes. They, though, are still INTPs. And so even though they are more social, that doesn't mean that they always get all the social cues. And so they have decided to stir the pot a little bit. They mess with things, kind of poke the bear a little bit, um, and then just playfully dance away <laughs> when they're in some social trouble. Although, of course, that will that will affect them, right? Because they, they do have INTP preferences. They are more of a get things going pattern. So in Linda Barron's vernacular, when we're talking about the dominant, this is an in charge style. The creative is a more get things going style. So they might be the idea generators or, hey, we should go do this thing or what about this? They have a, a, a more catalyst feel to them. And they are uh, very intuitive. So these INTPs are the ones that are going to really identify with the intuitive side of who they are. Uh, because they are INTPs still, though, despite this effervescent description I've given so far, they take in tons of information. They quickly play with that data. They quickly put it through a bunch of different models. And they are oftentimes complete encyclopedias of information about certain things that they're interested in. Like a creative INTP might be 
an encyclopedia of, of comic books or anime or musical theory or anything that they find themselves interested in. Uh, they're, they're going to be just like most INTPs, a total storehouse of information, though it might not be information that is practical, right? It yeah. might be something that's just a personal interest. They have a wide rate of interests. Um, and uh, when they are... Uh, when they are taking in information and quickly playing with it, uh, it means that they're going to lean a lot on both auditory and visual cues. So they tend to be creative in multiple spaces, mul multiple modalities. They're not just stuck with auditory or visual as a strength. They play in and out of both of them, which is actually a unique characteristic. Yeah. Most of the time we have a strong bent one side or the other, and particularly creative subtypes tend to be highly visual. But the INTP can play in both spaces, which is a little unique for them. Um, they are very much uh, goal focused when it comes to speaking, attending to word content and processing more obvious social feedback. So their goal orientation tends to light up when they're listening for information, when they're trying to define terms, when they're trying to understand what this means for, for as implications for people, that's when their goal orientation pops up, which is good to know because a lot of creative subtypes have a tendency to struggle with goal orientation. Usually they're a more playful subtype and motivation can be a challenge. And so it's good to know that for these INTPs, the goal part of their brain lights up when they start seeking definitions, when they start seeking impact on individuals and people. Hmm. Uh, they tend to jump around to various projects. Um, and they can find themselves distracted or scattered with uh, difficulty attending to official assignments. So jobs can be hard for a creative yeah. INTP. Caring about your job, caring about getting to the end product. If it's not something that is aligning with your interests, it might be very difficult to stay on task. Yeah. And they might just struggle finding a profession all by itself. Right? They're an INTP that might find themselves jumping from career to career or job to job trying to align their interests or something um, to try to make the job interesting for them. Uh, they also have a tendency to make things their own. So when they do end up in a more traditional profession, they're almost immediately getting going on changing that profession to be a little bit like to fit themselves, right? To be yeah. a little bit more, they're iconoclastic. And so they want to match what they're doing to their quirky personality. I think if you're an INTP listening right now and maybe you're a little older, middle age, and you still haven't figured out what you want to do when you grow up. Yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of creatives, not just INTPs, a lot of creative subtypes, I identify as a creative subtype. We often find ourselves jack of all trade, kind of just doing a lot of disparate things and not having necessarily a consistent through line. And then kind of having that experience later in life going, man, what do I want to be when I grow up? I feel like I should have already found that by now. I think it'd be a struggle for some creative subtypes, especially INTP creatives to go, oh, what do I do? I, I don't know. It could be a frustration, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and uh, I think in large part because the thing that uh, this INTP is naturally drawn to, it, it's hard to find practical outlets for it yeah it, we've talked about it with other uh, other podcasts in the series other creative subtypes that there's a desire to merge hobbies and profession like other types are really good at creating a clear delineation but creative subtypes are always trying to merge those things together <laughs> yeah and so it's like well i just spent five hours online researching this thing that nobody really cares about but now i have an insane amount of inf information about it how do i turn this into a profession <laughs> How do I turn my extraordinary understanding of anime into something that I can make some money at? And that is a harder ask, right? Yeah. It's a little more difficult for creative subtypes to do that. That said, uh, it is good to understand the motivation behind creative INTPs because, again, they struggle with motivation. So knowing when I'm defining something, when I'm trying to, when I'm trying to understand it and its a complexity and its implication on people, yeah. that's when I'm the most motivated. Uh, on top of that, Dario says, despite their more extroverted and open style, make no mistake, these INTPs maintain the type's need to analyze situations and control the integrity and quality of outcomes. It's simply hidden from others' view and drawn out over longer time frames. Meaning that whatever it is that you're doing as a career, make sure that you have some say in the quality of the outcome. Well, right? What I hear in that is 
you might be super creative and it looks to the outside world you're all over the place but you got standards damn it and you're going to make sure these are accurate and held up because it matters to you the creativity matters that it's precise it's got accuracy behind it it looks good it's not half-assed yeah well and that you have a say in that yeah i think it's really important so personal if, power and empowerment toward it mm -hmm, some control over how your person how your yeah. principles are manifest in the thing that you're doing so finding one's motivation structure i think is very powerful for creative intps What's the young impact on people? What it's the quality assurance? How do I make sure that we're as calibrated as possible? Yeah. These are things that might be very motivating no matter what career you choose. But that said, I do have a list. Here we go. Let's <laughs> okay. jump into it. So again, this is not comprehensive. Okay. These are just the kinds of careers that help wire I, uh, creative INTPs to become creative or are suited to more creative INTPs. We've got investigative journalist, research librarian, game designer, documentary filmmaker, curator, ethnographer, archaeologist, science communicator, user experience research um, or researcher, private investigator, travel writer, software developer, environmental consultant, art appraiser, and futurist. Let's go one layer deeper. Oh, by the way, I would also say, as we're talking about jobs and careers, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, when we talk about INTP creatives, any of the creative subtypes can really benefit from this idea of platform thinking. I, t I say this every episode for every type. If you're a creative INTP, you know, a platform, for example, is YouTube for a creative video person to be able to put their stuff out and distribute it. Uber is a, is a platform for somebody who wants to be an uh, Uber driver. You know, Etsy, you can create and sell things on Etsy or Shopify. These are platforms that enable solo creators or creative people to create, make something and then distribute it and put it out there, sell it, get value exchange for it. So be thinking if you're a creative subtype, that might be the avenue you go down. Is you're looking for a platform to connect to, to support you and create a container for your art, expression, creativity, etc. Mm -hmm. Let's go a layer deeper though. We talked about the two functions for INTP, the driver dominant introverted thinking, accuracy, decision-making function, and the co-pilot auxiliary extroverted intuition exploration function, which is the learning perceiving function, the analytic holistic attunement. How do these look? For creative uh, INTPs, their, uh, their extroverted intuition or exploration, that stays analytic. But their introverted thinking or accuracy, that first function, that now is holistic. So that's a little bit more open framed. And you can see this because there's not so much insistence on a single principle. There's a little bit more openness to how things get done. Yeah. Um, there's less insistence that you're right when you're a creative INTP. Uh, there's a little bit more leaning in on that brainstorming capacity. So it's a, it's a holistic introverted thinking or accuracy and an analytic extroverted intuition or exploration. So the neurotransmitter is dopamine. That's the chemical that the creative sub, all creative subtypes prefer, which mm -hmm. makes sense from a creative subtype standpoint. Yep. Uh, you ready to go to the next type? I am. All right, let's go over to normalizing INTPs. So okay. what does a normalizing INTP look like? Uh, normalizing is the opposite of creative. So uh, I know we usually talk about this at the end, but if you reverse the orientation, you get the more normalizing subtype, meaning that the introverted thinking or accuracy function is the more analytic and the extroverted intuition or exploration is the more holistic. And I mentioned that because uh, I think it makes sense to understand that the brain wiring is the exact opposite of creative in order to really get the sense that we've gone from one style that looks so bouncy, effervescent, creative, you know, possibly very extroverted appearing to the normalizing, which is very subdued. Um, it's a lot more of an introverted flavor. So these INTPs are uh, the most aligned with the general population. They have a linear, reflective, and analytic style. So as opposed to bouncing all over the place with creatives, this is a lot more linear, a lot more progressive. They process information one step at a time in a very rational way, staying a particular course. That makes them quiet, observant specialists in the workplace. Unlike the creative type, which usually is a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, this is a more specialized, has stayed with a single you know, sort of skill they've developed or an expertise they've developed 
and they're they're a lot better at staying on target with that. So they d- deeply focus in one area. Uh, it gives them an extraordinary degree of expertise. Uh, other people might actually find them a little boring because they're so one note. Hmm. Um, that said, when they are able to discuss the ins and outs of the thing that they've built expertise around, particularly if there's a problem to solve, they light up. And for them, problem solving is both work and play. So they get to do the thing they love to do as long as there's a problem around. They fit well in large conventional organizations. They favor steady positions. Um, They make their jobs interesting. Does that make sense? As opposed to the creative subtype that has a tr- has trouble finding something interesting, the normalizing subtype yeah. makes their job interesting to them, and that's one of the reasons why they don't struggle as much for and you know for motivation as the other subtypes. Now this, we're still talking about an INTP here, mm-hmm. as as normalizing language as you're using. This is still a very quirky intuitively wired INTP at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well. Uh, Despite the fact that they're more subtle, more patient, uh, in fact, actually, I thought that this was really interesting. Um, Dara says they're they're not as social. They're actually the the least social of the four subtypes. But their humor tends to be understated. He uh-huh. says their words can have multiple subtle meanings that poke fun even at the people they are with, without often hearing, uh, without others hearing it. And this is a kind of stress release. <laughs> so they might be making fun of the people they're around without other people knowing it to give themselves a little bit of like a, 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 a vent, a, a venting a little bit about the situation they find themselves in, even the, even if they have allowed themselves to be a little bit more wired in a normalized way. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> um, they usually have a coherent set of tools and methods that, you know, is uh, it meets professional standards. It's widely used, uh, but they're going to take these these methodologies that are general protocols, and they're going to start tweaking them. Mm. So they are still INTPs, and they just tweak them for incremental gains over time. So that that part of themselves that's always looking for leverage, they can't turn it off, even if they're in a normalizing position and have more normalizing wiring. They're such experts that they end up having their mind wired around the thing that they do. So uh, there's there's a lot of, uh, what, what do I say? Like Because competence is so important to INTPs and because they have chosen to specialize in their careers, oftentimes they find themselves, I mean, not every single time, obviously, because there's going to be, you know, millions of millions of INCPs around the world, hundreds of millions. So they can't all be the best in the world at whatever it is that they're doing. But they're the ones who find themselves in that position. They're the ones, if they end up becoming the best in the world, it's oftentimes a normalizing INTP who has just completely dedicated themselves to their craft. It just seems like this is the INTP that really draws a line around their specialty and masters everything inside that circle they drew Mm -hmm. around that subject matter. And they just know it all. They've gotten proficient about it perfected it yep yep exactly and they're very patient yeah. so that's another piece of it um because of that they also need hobbies right unlike the creative subtype that's always looking for ways to bring their hobbies into their career the normalizing INTP should be picking up hobbies outside of their career it's very important yeah. for them to do that so they don't become so one note but when they do that when they find like a copy you know maybe pick up a guitar or a musical instrument or something outside of it it's very important for them. It's a massive pressure release. And um, and oftentimes they find themselves in there. So you want me to read the list of Let's careers? talk about the careers, yeah. Okay, so these are, uh, none of these will be surprising, I'm sure, but these are the uh, uh, non-comprehensive list of careers for the, the normalizing INTP. Uh, statistician, actuary, architect, mathematician, financial analyst, database administrator, network engineer, civil engineer, cryptographer, industrial engineer, biomedical engineer, quality assurance analyst, materials scientist, geophysicist, and supply chain analyst. Hmm. So lots of engineers and analyst jobs. <laughs> well, and these are very uh, professionally tracked career paths. So usually most of those are going to require some type of university degree, professional certification or credentialing. Some of them, depending on if you're working for government, you might have to have government clearances. Like there's a lot of things you have to do in order to be qualified for those positions. Well, and what I noticed is on the list that you read before of the top 
you know, INTP careers, yeah. a lot of them were normalizing INTP careers. So I think the normalizing INTP is probably the type that's the most stereotypical. Yeah. That said, I would imagine that if an INTP has mistyped themselves here, it might be for like an ISTJ type um, or somebody who might be an INTJ or like mistype themselves as an INTJ because this is going to lean in on that patience and more of an affectation of judger qualities. Yeah. Okay. So I already mentioned the brain wiring, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's talk about the chemical neurotransmitter is serotonin, mm -hmm. is the preferred for normalizing subtypes. So dominant, it's testosterone. Creative, it's dopamine. And for normalizing, it's serotonin. Let's go a layer deeper. The driver, cognitive function, introverted thinking, accuracy. As mentioned, that's going to be more analytic. And the co-pilot of extroverted intuition or exploration, that is more holistic. More holistic. So mm -hmm. we're the opposite of creative. Exactly. Okay. So let's talk about what does a harmonizing INTP look like? Okay. So harmonizing INTPs may not know that they're INTPs at all. Uh, and in the usual spirit of har the harmonizing subtype, this is usually, not always, but this is usually a more seasoned version of the type. Um, that's one over time and with a little bit of maturity. But of course, a younger person can also be a harmonizing INTP. So this is this is a subtype that is usually in a people helping role, like a psychologist or a diplomat. And their specialty is human interactions. That's the case for most of the harmonizing subtypes and INTPs are no different. Now, we also did a, an episode for INTJs. And what's interesting is that the harmonizing INTJ is a very unique style and the harmonizing INTP is very similar. They have a very similar style of brain wiring. It's called diamond-shaped patterns. And these diamond-shaped patterns are specialties. They're things that have been figured out and maybe even hard won to be able to interact with different modes of operation. And that's the case for the harmonizing INTP as well. They are comfortable with lots of fuzzy input. They tend to focus on methodology over technicalities. So they're very process-oriented. And they fly, find clear definitions and models to be essential in this challenging domain, meaning that they're taking in lots of fuzzy pieces of information, but they have very strong models that they're plugging this information into. What does fuzzy pieces of information mean? I think, I think what that means is that they're not as insistent that other people define their terms before they take their information in. Gotcha. So some INTPs require the other person to do a bit of legwork, right? If you're gonna, If you're going to come to me with information, make sure you get your facts straight. I think the style of INTP is a little bit more open to letting people just communicate what's going on for them. And then the INTP puts the onus on themselves to interpret the information. So fuzzy, fuzzy data. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's what you have to do when you're in a more human role, right? You can't insist that the other person get, every, you know, cross all their T's and dot all their I's, particularly if they're in a people helping role, because you're not going to require the other person to do as much thought labor you're going to bring that on yourself a little bit more. But in order to do that, in order to interpret that information well, you're going to have to have a very strong storehouse of models and uh, and things that you're taking this information in in order to do that clarification process. And a harmonizing INTP is more willing to take that role on for themselves. Yeah. Okay. So they are patient listeners. They can hold multiple models and methods in a light way. Uh, they're more tolerant than other INTPs. And they're able to shift with others' perspectives and needs. So unlike the dominant INTP that once they've decided on something, it's almost impossible to get them to shift perspectives. This is an INTP that isn't holding tightly to things. It's, uh, they're, they're a little bit more open to shifting perspectives naturally and helping other people understand things by sort of flexing and flowing to match the other person. Yeah. Which is why I said they might not even recognize that they're an INTP at all because they're 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 using their INTP powers in order to meet the other person where they're at, if that makes sense, as opposed to requiring people to meet them, you know, halfway or all the way. Uh, again, they've got that diamond shaped patterning um, that is unique to the harmonizing subtypes. And that means that they're going to have different modes of operation that they'll bring to different situations. And they're usually, just like the normalizing INTP has this like expertise in one thing, 
harmonizing INTPs have little pockets of expertise that they're bringing together and weaving together in order to do a single output, which is usually helping other people. Yeah. Uh, they experiment with questions, correlating and shifting angles until something lands and they get the needed effect when they're helping others. Um, but the downside of this INTP is that daily details for self-maintenance can be a major challenge. Yeah. So they are the most open, the most amenable, the most helpful, and the hardest to deal with the day-to-day -day life and grind. So they really need support when it comes to those aspects. They work small, personal scale, right? One-to-one -one or small groups. Uh, they facilitate others' potential rather than calculating odds or gains. So they're using that second function of extroverted intuition or exploration. They're using it to spot human potential more than they are leveraging, you know, and tweaking things to get personal gain. They can sit with the person or group in a mindful, patient way, acting as a catalyst for problem solving to meet the unstated needs in the room. And because they have INTP preferences, they're able to do this in a disassociated way. So unlike other counselors or psychologists that might really take on other people's emotions and challenges and burdens, this INTP creates a separation so that they're able to deal with all of this without owning it. Although they may later on have some challenges, like they might not really understand how much it's impacting them. And this INTP, if they are in this kind of role, might need ways to let off steam because how it's impacting and affecting them might be asynchronous, right? Like later on, they might have some challenges and struggles from helping facilitate other people's problems that they didn't even know they were taking on. So what I'm hearing you say is this INTP, in order to work with people and be receptive to people's energy, they need to have good boundaries. They need to know how to interface and not let it affect them because they can get, you know, that three-year-old or inferior of extroverted feeling or harmony can get overrun with people needs. Right. Well, I actually think that what's interesting is uh, in those moments, they do feel like they have good boundaries because they're stepping back and disassociating. It doesn't feel like they're taking it on, but it might be something like some stuff might get through anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's, it's not as much about having the clear boundary in the moment as it is having a methodology later to let off steam, right? If yeah. they have odd stress responses coming up in these moments, they need to have a way to process some of it through, even if they're not 100% sure why they're being affected by it. I mean, INFJs need the same thing after they're out with people, right? They do, but I think they're more conscious of it. And yeah. this would be less just being around other people. This would be specifically facilitating other people's challenges. So let's talk about some of the careers that this subtype might cluster around. All right. Okay. Once again, it is not a comprehensive list, sure. but these are the kinds of things that this INTP could do, or it would help wire them into this subtype. Uh, the list is clinical psychologist, counselor, social worker, mediator, human resources specialist, occupational therapist, speech language pathologist, conflict resolution specialist, life coach, career counselor, family therapist, educational consultant, special education teacher, substance abuse counselor, and community outreach coordinator. Yeah. Yeah. So these are very like un I unlike most INTP lists that include architect and architects and mathematicians, uh, this would be this would be reserved for a more seasoned style of INTP. Yeah, I could see this subtype potentially mistyping as an INFJ, mm -hmm. INFP, ISFP, like anything that has a high empathy, t you know, type, personality type, this subtype might look like those types and mistype in certain dynamics. Exactly. And the big way that you can tell the difference is the, the disassociation, yeah. right? The capacity to completely disassociate. Now, uh, an IFJ type can also do that since they share introverted thinking or accuracy as one of their functions, but they're going to have a more like the, the reaction or response of pulling in other people's stuff, right? That's going to be less asynchronous. It's going to be very obvious in the moment with this type. It's not going to feel like they're, they're really receiving that information. They're going to feel like they have like, like a clear distinction between self and others. And it will only be something that maybe shows up later asynchronously. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if this type, you know, thinks that they're a more feeler type. That said, 
it is not common for INTPs to be harmonizing younger in their life. It yeah. is far more common for them to step in the subtype in their 40s, 50s, 60s, much later on. It can happen when they're younger as a survival strategy to just be able to you know, move through the world if the world has communicated that it's unacceptable for them to be INTPs. But for the most part, this is a much later in life experience. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go a layer deeper, talk about neurotransmitter. The preferred chemical is estrogen mm -hmm. for the harmonizing subtype mm -hmm. of INTP. What do the cognitive functions look like? That driver, introverted thinking, accuracy, and the co-pilot auxiliary of extroverted intuition or exploration. So this is the opposite subtype from the dominant. So if the dominant had both of their functions prefer an analytic bent, this would be both the functions preferring holistic. So both introverted thinking or accuracy and extroverted intuition or exploration would have a holistic expression. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, one final comment about this. If you are identifying with this harmonizing subtype, you know, when we talked about the creative, we talked about plugging into a platform like YouTube, Uber, something that can help support you and also create a container. This is a more one-to-one -one subtype. So our recommendation is being people-focused, finding a person or a few people that you can partner with that might be able to put you forward. They can see the value, the intangible value you bring as a harmonizing INTP. They can vouch for you, help put you forward, help connect you to the people that you can help or the types of projects you can work on. So I think this subtype is very much a people-focused mm. subtype. And yeah, that can and be a great strategy. Yeah, and you need uh, a group of supportive people who help you get the mundane done. Yeah. Right, L the day-to-day -day life. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, clustering real quick. So just INTP listening, you probably want this information. Types tend to cluster. So for example, creative subtypes, dopamine chasers tend to cluster with other creative subtypes. Dopamine chasers, serotonin, you know, normalizing subtypes tend to cluster and want to be around other normalizing serotonin focused subtypes. Now that's across all 16 types, not just INTPs. But when we come to the dominant and the harmonizing, they tend to be attracted toward each other. There tends to be a desire for dominant subtypes to connect with and be around harmonizing and harmonizing subtypes to seek out and be around dominant. So we have, if you could think of a quadrant, you know, dominant top left, creative top right, bottom left is harmonizing, bottom left is normalizing. You could almost see a cross diagonal of attraction between the top left top and the bottom right, but there's not a cross between the top right and the bottom left. No, oh, yeah. They kind of avoid each other yeah. in a way. Well, and that's a good thing to visualize too, because um, take, building on what you talked about, there's also a capacity to move through these quadrants. And so uh, there, there is groupings that like each other, but there's also opportunities here for moving into different quadrants ourselves, right? Like we can visit or maybe even take on the characteristics we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. One of the big reasons to understand these careers and how they wire us is that you have, you have a plasticity to you. You have a capacity to visit some of these other you know, traits that are available, and so if you are, say, a, you know, a, a creative subtype and you want to move into a more, you know, sort of a, a streamlined, more assertive place, maybe find a job that you're not hopping from thing to thing, maybe take a little bit more power for yourself, you can move into dominant INTP traits. Yeah. And a career choice will require that from you. It doesn't mean it will be effortless, right? It'll get you out of your comfort zone, but the contest, contact excuse me, the context itself creates an environment in which that uh, is a little more conducive and it itself is your impetus and motivation to do so. So you also have options here. And if there are some traits that we talked about with some of these subtypes that are very attractive to you, then consider the style of career that will help you move into that space. Yeah. So again, one of the big takeaways here is that your subtype can indicate the type of career you're attracted to. And it can influence the type of career you choose for yourself. And if you flip it, the type of career you choose will start to wire you to express a certain subtype. Mm -hmm. So if you want to lean into one of these subtypes we talked about today that you don't typically identify with, pick a career that moves you that direction. That's probably the fastest way to get there is to choose something in alignment with the energies of that subtype to be able to lean into that 
that uh, aspect. Well, and it's, oh, I was going to mention, it's hard to, to go, um, uh, diagonal. diagonal. So if you're a creative and you are, if you would like to move more normalizing or vice versa, it's easier to move side or up than it is diagonally. So if you're normalizing, maybe consider dominant before creative or harmonizing before creative. It's a little easier to move to the side because you're only working on one function at that point. You're only trying to master the other other half of that function. Yeah. So there's also pathways here um, and it can help create almost like a personal growth plan yeah. of directions you're moving and sort of a, a you know the next lily pad of the journey. Okay. So you've been listening and hanging with this conversation up till now. You don't have a microphone on your side, but we still want to hear from you. Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Ask a question, leave a comment, or more importantly, share your story. Are you an INTP in the midst of your career? Have you noticed a pattern of which one of these subtypes you identify with? What about the career you chose? Does it lend itself to your subtype wiring and the way you're, you express? Or is it kind of you know pushing against that? Are you always fighting against it all the time? What is your experience? We would love to hear your story because a story is a compressed experience we can relate to, hear from you, and then other people can comment and learn from what your journey has been as an INTP on your career path. So come over, personalityhacker.com, make your voice heard. Yeah, and we'll also make sure to provide a link for the materials that Dr. Dario Nardi has available at this time. At the time of this recording, he hasn't written a book on it, but he has written some materials. Yeah. So we'll make sure to link to that if you uh, want to go further down the rabbit's hole. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. It helps me out a lot because then I know people are listening. So even no matter what the review is, please leave one because uh, it's... Leave it's, a good review. Leave a good review. <laughs> feeds my soul. Well, just knowing people are listening at all is, is a boon. Uh, we are also on YouTube. You might be watching this as a video podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can like. And if you want to uh, hear more like it, you can subscribe and hit the bell in order to get notifications for new episodes are out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it in all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. And if we've thrown you for a loop, am I an INTP? You might be thinking for the first time, or maybe you thought you were an INTP, but now you're reevaluating. Head over to personalityhacker.com and take our free online assessment. It might not be the final definitive piece of information you need to find your best fit type, but we think it's pretty solid and it will help you on your journey of self-discovery. If you end up at that assessment and you are an INTP, we have one of these for all 16 types, but consider getting the INTP owner's manual. It's not an owner's manual just to get and hold on to. It's designed to help you create an owner's manual custom tailored for your personality and your life. The you are here dot on the map of your life and then developing a plan of where to go next. So I recommend getting that. It's going to help you deep dive into how you're cognitively wired and all the growth aspects that relate to career, relationship, and your lifestyle design. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm-hmm.